Okay, well, they can't be here tonight, but there are nine different species of fish who would be particularly proud of tonight's speaker. They are freshwater fish. You'll find them in rivers, lakes, sometimes in India and Sri Lanka. Their genus, their family name for all nine species is Dokinzia. The scientists who first described these fish as a genus named them to honor the British author, the zoologist, and former Charles Simonyi Professor for Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University, Richard Dawkins. So he's got nine fish namesakes. The, uh, the males are especially good looking, I'd have to say, a little on the, on the flamboyant side. They grow long filaments off their fins. They, they dangle and dance in the water. Those filaments are, uh, they resemble peacock's tails, and they take a lot of energy and time to build and maintain, but they do get attention. They get a lot of attention. But meanwhile, far, far away from Sri Lanka, hundreds of thousands of miles away, deep in space, there's a rock moving slowly around the sun, one of the many asteroids in the belt between uh, Mars and Jupiter. And in 1982, when astronomers found rock number 8,331, they decided to name it again after the zoologist, author, professor, and our guest tonight, Richard Dawkins, the fish guy. So, now it's not everybody who gets his name on nine fish and a sun orbiting rock, but Richard Dawkins has had that kind of career. Over the last half century, his mind has ranged widely over so many topics, evolution, zoology, cosmology, culture, religion, computing, himself. Uh, this, new, this is part two of the himself sequence. This is um, it's called A Brief Candle in the Dark. It's the sequel to the, to the Appetite for Wonder, the first one. And um, in addition to this, he's, he's been on expeditions to the deep sea. He's written 13 books, I think. Most of them, or certainly, I think, more, easily more than half have been bestsellers. He's had television series. He's lectured everywhere. If he's now one of the most famous science writers in the world, that's because of his remarkable gift. He is, and I'm quoting here, a master of the art of making things clear. He thinks very, very well and carefully. He writes very, very well and beautifully. And you may not always agree with him, but when Richard Dawkins writes it down, he gets your attention. And the interesting thing is that phrase, a master of the art of making things clear, appears in one of his books, A River Out of Eden. He wrote the phrase not to describe himself, but to talk about a relative, not a fish or a rock, in this case, a living biological relative, his uncle. I think it's his dad's brother. And the story he tells about Uncle Henry Collier Dawkins gives me a taste for what it must be like growing up in a family of really smart and really odd people. <laughs> uh, uncle Henry was a professor of statistics at Oxford where Richard also teaches. He was a very good teacher, I mean, really very, very good. He had a way of easing his students into a subject dangerously studded with mathematics and probability curves and algebra and so but he'd get you there. So one time Richard calls his uncle, he says, I've got a few biology kids I want to send your way so you can tutor them. Can I come over and, and talk to you about them? So he goes to his uncle's office. He says, okay, I've got so-and-so, I've got so-and-so. His uncle's taking notes. And at some point, Richard leans over and notices that his uncle is writing in what seems to be code, or at least what he's writing is not English. It looks like it's Swahili. Uh, the Dawkins have lived in Kenya, so you maybe, maybe that's, anyway, Richard says, well, that's very confidential of you taking notes in Swahili. Good God, no, says his uncle. Swahili, no, everybody in this department speaks Swahili. So Richard says, well, what, what are you writing in? He says, it's a Koli, of course, a language found mostly in northern Uganda and southern Sudan, like, of course. <laughs> So the Dawkins family apparently is not like the rest of us. They have a, a cerebral range they draw on that the rest of us may not quite reach equal. So the cool thing is, though, that both the uncle and the nephew had put their brains, their considerable brains, in service to us, their teachers. So they look, they consider, they explain, and in doing so, they make the world more accessible, more beautiful, and more intelligible. And the world has noticed. So it's no accident that one of those Asian fish, named for Richard, one of the nine species, is called Dokinzia exclamatio, which uh, I would translate as wow. So <laughs> let me bring to the stage the master of wow, Richard Dawkins. I think, I think that's without doubt the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs>
So let's talk about this. Apparently, they like you. So let's talk about your the uncle. I think the young, among uh, just briefly, it doesn't really matter in anything. But but the uncle had a railroad. They, remember when he's yeah. What's he that? was yes. Um, he was always known by his second name of Collier. By the way, his first oh, name was Henry. Um, he returned on the late the last train from London to Oxford, and in the Oxford car park there was an arm. Which, which, which you had to put a, a coin in and, uh, to, in order to, to raise the arm and get your car out. And the arm had broken down, so everybody was trapped in the car park. Um, and, and the station officials had all gone home. Uncle Collier was on his bike, so it was no problem to him, but out of sheer altruism, he broke the arm and marched up to the station master's office and parked it outside with a note giving his name and address. Uh, saying why he'd done it. And so all the car people were gratefully pr drove home. He was, uh, he was prosecuted for this <laughs> and, and fined, um, which I think is an outrage. But years later, after his death, I happened to meet an old professor of physics called Nicholas Curti. And when he heard my name, he said, Dawkins, are you any relation of the man who broke the arm at the stake? <laughs> So I said, well, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm his nephew. And he said, let me shake your hand. Your <laughs> uncle was a hero. <laughs> we won't mention the relative of yours who bombed Yale University. We'll just let it go. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about your writing. Um, people, regular people, wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you think about breakfast, you think about the chores you've got to do during the day. And, uh, and if you can get through the day, that's a good day. Uh, you once wrote that there's an anesthetic of familiarity, a sedative of ordinariness, which dulls the senses and hides the wonder of existence. That all of us don't pause at beetles or gaze at the moon that often. We just do what we do. You notice your books are kind of like thumbtacks that just say, and the world is beautiful and mysterious. I'm wondering, how did this start? Like, were you born this way? Did you stop at Buttercups at age four? Or? Not really, but I've, I've long liked science fiction. And if you, if you think about what it would be, one of the, the attractions, the romances of science fiction is you imagine yourself going to a totally alien world. You go to Mars, you go to Proxima Centauri, one of its planets or something, and you see totally strange things, utterly weird things. We are in that situation, but on this planet. It's just that we've dulled, we've been dulled by the anesthetic of familiarity. And uh, what I want to do is to recapture that feeling that you would have if you went to another planet and saw everything totally strange. It is totally strange. And we shouldn't let ourselves be dulled by the sheer familiarity. Well, isn't it, isn't it when you're three, doesn't everything seem kind of wonderful? And when you're 30, less so. And when you're 50, uh. so I, I have a sense that maybe there's a boy in you that just wouldn't grow up. Or, no, no. Well, I, I think it's a nice thought that, 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 ch that children have that, but I'm not sure that they do. I think I think oh. um, uh, it. I, I I try, and I think other writers like Carl Sagan try to 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 to, to recapture that feeling, and um, to, to use a phrase like the anesthetic of familiarity does. Um, I think help help to get it. When you think that that here here we are on this planet, we, we, it, it's as though we've just woken up, but we haven't just woken up. We've we've drifted in a rather boring way into it. We've we've <laughs> we've, we've grown up in it. But if you had just come round from the anaesthetic, and when you think that you are the product of purely naturalistic forces on this planet, atoms bun jumping bumping against each other and producing through this remarkable process called evolution by natural selection, producing objects of the prodigious complexity that we are, with brains that have evolved to the point where, where, where they are capable of understanding the process that brought them here. I mean, that, that blows away the anesthetic of familiarity. Well, there, there's one, uh, speaking of that, there's one time you're in Panama and you're watching some driver ants. I think it's where you are. And, uh, you're waiting for the queen. Maybe all English people wait for the queen, whatever the queen. So there's a, a moving wave. This is what you describe. You say, she appears, 
as a moving wave of worker frenzy, a boiling peristaltic ball of ants with linked arms. She's somewhere in the middle in this seething ball of workers. And then you say, her soldiers are guarding the master copies of the very instructions that made them do the guarding. Whoa. So the queen has given them their inheritance, their genetic inheritance, and their genetic inheritance says to them, protect the queen. So you're watching a kind of riddle in motion. Right. Um, they contain the genes which make them do the protecting of the queen, and the master copy of those genes is in the queen. So they are defending the master copy. Um, I called it the Ark of the Covenant. Um, <laughs> It's just that I'm so jealous that you get to think that. Like, did you just, did you think of that later? Or <laughs> did it occur to you? Did you just sit there and no. watch the queen go by and say, oh my God, there's a riddle here. I'm looking at a walking riddle. Well, the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, that's, that's just the Bible, of course, and, uh, which everybody knows their Bible. We'll, we'll You're a, make... I don't even want you to go near the Bible here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with that. Um, but, but I mean, it, no, I'm it, asking like, does this come easy to you or is it like, is, do you see things in layers? Like, it seems like, I don't know whether it's fluent or whether you're working with nine pieces of paper going, no, it's not a peristaltic ball. It's no, a no, ball. no, 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 I think it's pretty spontaneous. And, Whoa. Uh, yeah. uh, this is just unfair. Um, but isn't it, <laughs> but isn't it a wonderful thought that, that, that the, these, these workers, they're not going to reproduce themselves. They're sterile. Mm. And they are, they, they are guarding the queen with jaws agape, and they're guarding her because copies of the genes that are making them do it, and the, uh, copies of the genes that gave them these massive jaws, are in the queen. Mm. And it's only the queen's copy that's going to be preserved. And so um, the rule that says genes work for their own preservation is here, in this particular case of ants, is here working sort of vicariously across to, to another individual. So you could think of the queen as the master copy, the, the master die, the Ark of the Covenant. <sighs> okay. Uh, there is, I detect sometimes in reading your books, there's a kind of a fight going on between the logician and the poet in you. So let me just deal with the logician first. I think if most of us see a magic trick, we would just go, whoa, that's amazing. And you'd fall for it a little bit. You were watching TV on some shameful afternoon, apparently, and Are you, you watched... Are ashamed of this story? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm asking it. So uh, there's a muscle man towing a railroad truck with a fishing line. Can you describe what you were seeing? Uh, yeah. Yes, he was uh, almost naked. He had uh, a fish hook through his back, through the skin of his back, uh, and a fishing line attached to this railway truck. And he was straining and pulling, and the, and the skin of his back was kind of being pulled outwards by this gruesome thing, the, 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 um, the, the, the fish hook. And, the, and slowly the railway truck was, was, was moving. moving forwards. And, and I forget how old I was, but I wasn't a child, and to my eternal shame, I just did exactly what you said. I said, wow, that's remarkable. And I didn't say, well, I wonder where the electric motor is, and, or, or um, Something well, I mean, like isn't that a little bit hard? I, he wrote, why didn't I immediately dismiss it as a trick because the laws of physics cannot be violated that way? Like, why couldn't you just go, whoo, and let it be? Like, you seem to feel that if you're gullible, like, you, you want, your brain is monitoring your senses at all times. They fall for nothing. Doesn't that mean that you don't get a lot of the ziz of being, like, don't you, like, you, you can't... No, I mean, I enjoy conjuring tricks very much. I, I love watching Penn and Teller and Darren Brown and, and, and people like that. Um, but why but is it a shame? Why is it a shame? It's a shame that I, that I didn't just say, well, that's, an, that's a trick and I wonder how it's done. I mean, I actually believed it. And I'm, I'm very, Just very join the human race there. Like most people, yeah. you know, for a minute. Uh, I... Okay, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't do it now, but in, in those days I was sufficiently gullible, and that gives me sympathy for people who are gullible about other things. <laughs> All right, let me... <laughs> it's just that, that there, there are so many things in life, like, like, you know, you take a big heavy ball and a little light ball and you throw them off of a, a tower, and it's just weird to think that the little ball will land as quickly, or you take a diamond, which is the hardest thing that I can think of, and someone tells you it's full of air. And there's nothing, full of space, I mean. Space. There's, yeah, there's nothing, I guess what you 
feel about the world is often wrong. And you seem to be afraid to think wrong. Well, I am afraid of being taken for a ride. I'm afraid of being fooled. Um, I, would, I would rather be thought a Philistine than a gullible fool. Not everybody's like that. Um, <laughs> there are numerous stories of people being taken for a ride. There's a lovely, a lovely incident when one of the Beatles records was sent to a music critic. Uh, and he, as it happened, he was sent a, a faulty copy. And so on one side of the record, there, was, there were Beatles songs. And on the other side, there was nothing but engineer testing sounds. There's boop, 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 and things like that, all the way through the thing. And this music critic said, well, side one is very good Beatles record and, and the songs, and, but side two, John Lennon is here breaking new ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I would, I would rather be thought a Philistine and say there's something wrong with side two, um, uh, uh, okay. ra rather than be a gullible fool. Let me go to the poetry side. I'm going to read you something. Uh, this is, you're, you're trying to figure out um, just how unlikely it is for anyone to be alive at any moment. How it feels to me, and I guess to you as well, is that the present moves from the past to the future like a tiny spotlight inching its way across a gigantic ruler of time. Everything behind the spotlight, darkness, the darkness of the dead past. Everything ahead of the spotlight, the darkness of the unknown future. The odds of your century being the one in the spotlight are the same as the odds of a penny tossed down at random is going to land on a particular ant crawling somewhere on a road from New York to San Francisco. In other words, it's overwhelmingly probable that you are dead. <laughs> That's an incredible piece of writing. So let me re-ask just the second and my last time. Like, did this come out of you spontaneously? <laughs> Or is this the 15th draft? No, no, it, no, it is. I mean, the, we, I, actually, that, that originally came in the Christmas lectures that I gave. The, right. this, the, uh, the, the Royal Institution in London has this thing that goes back to Michael Faraday in the 1820s of lectures for children. And I was invited to give them one year. And, and we actually had a, not, it wasn't a laser, it was a, it was a spotlight that sort of moved across a gigantic ruler a, a, across oh, the, this was literal. The, uh, the, the stage. I mean, it, it is a... It's a sort of arresting thought that when you compare the, the, the lifespan that we have, a few decades, with the time before we were born and the time when we're dead after, we're, after we die, um, it is an astonishingly short time. And from the point of view of a sort of godlike physicist looking down on the whole span of time, um, it is overwhelmingly probable that we're either dead or not yet born. Um, and so, Enjoy it while you've got it. And that's <laughs> right. really the uh, well, Let me ask you about the way you write stuff. Um, you have described yourself as having an adaptationist bias, uh, excuse me, uh, to describe how evolution works. I, I want to choose, the, I find this wonderful, but I want to sort of go through it. Let's suppose I'm a bat, and my problem is I'm hungry and I want to eat, but I'm a night creature. So you ask, well, what's the best way to be a bat? And this takes you, uh, because the choices are, you could use light or antennae or smell or hearing or touch or whatever. How, would, how do you go from there? Well, um, physics allows you to use whatever medium is available. Um, light is not available. You could make light, have a, have a flashlight, but that's immensely expensive. Um, or you could use sound, and that's what bats do. Um, they, they give very, very high-pitched cries, and they time the echo before it, um, they, the echo bounces off, sorry, the, the sound bounces off an insect prey yeah. and, and comes back. And the brains of bats have been evolved to such a high degree that, that they have a perception which is not far short of the sort of perception that, that we can get with our, with our eyes, and bats can navigate through fine wires that just allow them to pass through. Bats can catch insects on the wing in total darkness by using echoes. And the, and the story becomes more elaborate when you say, well, in, in order for this to work, the 
uh, this, the cries that they emit have got to be extremely high pitched because that, only that way do you get sufficient resolution. So they go, like, or much, much higher. Much higher than yeah. that. Yeah, um, but then it hurts your ear. Like, and that... then the problem is that, it, that in order to get a decent echo back, uh, the, the, the outgoing sound has got to be very, very loud. So that damages your ears. You deafen yourself with the, uh, the sheer loudness of the sound. Make it quieter, and then you can't hear the echo. So you're stuck in a bind there. So what at least some bats do is temporarily switch the ear off immediately before emitting the cry. And they do that. They've got muscles attached to the little bones in the, in the ear which transmit the sound. Tug on the muscle, which temporarily deafens them, emit this gigantically loud cry, release the muscle just in time to get the echo back, and then go through the cycle again, pull on the bone to make, it, uh, to make themselves deaf, and you go through this deafen, cry, undeafen, listen. Deafen, cry, undeafen, listen. That sounds OK until you realize that when they're doing the final killing run into the insect, they're doing this 50 times a second. So the final, the final machine gun-like burst as they dive into the insect, brrr, and, and every one of those, of those little pulses that, that you hear there is, is, is temporarily deafened and then, and then released. Isn't natural selection wonderful? Yeah. But isn't it kind of cool that you look at a bat and you think, since you're hungry and it's dark, let me roll back your batness to the very beginning, as if you were an engineer sitting at a blank page trying to come up with a design. It, it, this particular way of writing about nature, is it, um, if you had to defend, defend is, it, is it working because people think in stories? Yes, or? I think so. I mean, it, it's, it's vulnerable, of course, to the, to the error that the bat thinks it out, and you have to make sure that they don't get that error. I mean, this is all done by evolution. But, it, but the, this engineering approach of saying, what would I do if I was an engineer? How would I design a bat? Uh, and um, and the, the way I do it is to lay out all the various possibilities and then say, which one do the bats actually use? And another, another way that, that a, an engineer might think of would be to use the Doppler shift um, as, the, as the bat approaches the insect or the insect approaches the bat. And there are indeed some bats that you do use the Doppler shift. Um, let me ask about metaphor. You are the author of probably the most famous modern metaphor in science, the selfish gene. I don't know how you came up with that, but, but once you did, do you, do you, what did it do for you, and what did it not do for you? I think that was in some ways a bad title, actually. I mean, I'd, um, I, I, it, with, with hindsight, it might have been better to call it the immortal gene, uh, and that would have fitted just as well. Um, the selfish gene gives the wrong idea. It gives the idea that animals or living things are selfish, and actually it's the genes that are selfish. And, and well, see, that's my, that was the first question, like who is exactly selfish in this, when you say the self, if the selfish one is the gene, then if I'm full of selfish genes and I'm just being, I don't know, driven by them, then do I, or is it the selfish individual? No, the, 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 the selfish gene can drive you as an individual to be altruistic. And the, a lot of the book is about that. A lot, lot of the book is showing how, how selfish genes is the kind of immutable law that the genes are selfish. But selfish genes can give rise to altruistic individuals. And, and the book is largely about um, altruistic individuals. Uh, it's been even worse misunderstood as, be, as being an advocacy of selfishness. Uh, ah. And I've, I've been sort of courted by ultra libertarians who think I'm saying that, that it's right that, that rich people should, you know, sort of screw the poor <laughs> and things like that. Uh, the, but you did say uh, that I would happily bring out a new book called The Cooperative Gene. Yes. That this would be pretty much an identical it book to the selfish. It would be identical to the selfish gene. There's a, there's a lot in many of my books about genes cooperating with each other. Well, does that mean like, so if I'm a, an herbivore, I'll have certain teeth that are good for plants. I'll have yes, a tummy for exactly plants. what it means. And if you're a meat eater, then yes. you'll have a different tummy, that's different right. anus, different um, mouth, and all this. Uh, genes are selected against the background of the environment in which they live, but that includes the other genes in the, in the, in the genome. So the reason why genes are cooperative is that they are 
Each gene is selected against the background of the other genes in the gene pool, which means the species. So in a herbivore species, herbivorous teeth, herbivorous guts, herbivorous behavior patterns, herbivorous brains um, all go together. They're not actually... So if I were an herbivore and I just had a meat-eating gut, it would screw, screw it, up things. That's right. I mean, yeah. it, wouldn't, it, 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 it wouldn't work if you were, if you were a herbivore with, with, with one thing built to be a carnivore. It wouldn't so, work. so thus the cooperation. Yes. But then things get a little confusing from time to time. Um, the metaphor sometimes runs away from you. One time you were with a Japanese TV crew. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, th th this Japanese TV crew um, turned up in Oxford in a, a London taxi, um, and they, they filled the London taxi. There were sort of tri tripods and things sticking out of all the windows, and they arrived, and, um, the, well, the first thing that happened was that the official interpreter couldn't speak English, and so... <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, the, 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 the director had to explain to me what he wanted, which was he wanted me to be interviewed in the taxi. I couldn't quite understand why this was, but, si but anyway, I, I, I was in the taxi. It was a London taxi, so the, the driver didn't know Oxford. Um, London taxi drivers know London very well, but they don't know Oxford. And so I, was, I didn't have an interviewer because the interpreter was, had been sent away. Um, and so I had to just talk into the camera. The cameraman was with me, and I was in the taxi. And I had to sort of just talk ad lib into the camera, and then over my shoulder give instructions to the driver, because he'd been told to take the scenic route through Oxford. And I, I was sort of say, talking about selfish genes, I'd say, turn left here. And, then, <laughs> um, um, and afterwards, uh, we, we managed to sort of finish the interview, finish the monologue, I should say. And I asked the director, but why did you want me to be filmed in a taxi cab? And he said, ha, huh, are you not author of Taxi Cab Theory of Evolution? <laughs> and I said, I don't just think I quite understand <laughs> what, you, what you mean. And, and, and I, I afterwards worked out that one of the concepts that I put forward is the, the idea of the, the individual organism as the vehicle for, <laughs> for the gene, and I presume that a Japanese translation of one of my books must have translated vehicle more specifically as taxi cab. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about political correctness, and this is religious issues aside. Has the metaphors you've used ever like, gotten you in trouble with unusually sensitive readers? Have you offended trans folks or women or Scottish people or gays or...? Um, well, the selfish gene itself is, has been much misunderstood by people on the left who've, who've assumed it was an advocacy of selfishness. Um, I'm trying to think of any of the others that might have... The reason I ask is because I noticed in reading this book, like, there, the mood in Oxford anyway, or at least in this version, this book, version of Oxford, there's a section in here where you are, are an official in Oxford, one of the colleges of Oxford, and there's a pudding it's a, this oh, would yes. never happen in the United States. I can't even imagine. Yes. There's a pudding with, it's black cake with white sauce. Yes, and, yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay, it's called, this, this pudding was called Negre en chemise. A black in a nightgown or something? Uh, that's right, it means, it means bl black man in a, in, a, in a nightshirt or in a shirt. Um, and um, the chaplain of the college, uh, it, it was my duty as sub-warden of the college to say, welcome to new fellows and to um, say farewell to old ones in a, in a formal speech. And so I had to make a formal speech saying farewell to the chaplain. Now, the chaplain had a very strong objection to this pudding, understandably enough. It's a very unpleasant racist uh, uh, name. And so I went to the chef and asked him if at the farewell dinner for the chaplain he would put this dish on, but not with that name. I asked him to call it prêtre en surplice, which means priest in a surplus. Um, and, um, That's quite a walk uh, and, and from one to the other. He, he, well, it's, it still captures that black-white oh, yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. That's um, good. And um, he agreed, and so um, that, that, that happened. And, and uh, I, I made my speech explaining why I had done this. But unfortunately, the next term, I was no longer sub-warden and no longer had any power. 
and I, it, the pudding was served up again under the original. That's table. so it's, weird. Yes, it is. Like, is it still being served? No, it's still, no, but we got a new chef now. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> there was also something called spotted dick pudding, but I won't go there. <laughs> That's true. That was obje that was objected to on grounds of sexism. Uh, there are. There are self-correcting metaphors, and, there's, and you seem to delight in them, even if they're not yours. Um, one of them comes from Doug Adams at the restaurant at the end of the universe. There was a lot of talk about that we, animals exist purely for our benefit. And, yes, yes. You know, we should not bother with them. They're just animals, and we can eat them, club them, whatever we want to do. And uh, so he invents an animal that perfectly... Yes. <laughs> um, do you know this? It's a lovely story. The restaurant at the end of the universe... Um, and uh, Arthur Dent and Zaphod Beeblebrox and others are at this restaurant. And um, as they're at the table, a large bovine creature comes up to the table and announces itself, I am your dish of the day. Uh, can I interest you in parts of my body? Um, uh, my liver, perhaps? Or uh, the rump is very good. Uh, I've been exercising and eating a lot of grain, so there's lots of good meat there. And, Poor Arthur is absolutely horrified by this, and he questions the beast, and the beast then enters into a sort of moral philosophic dialogue and says, well, for years people worried about the morality of eating animals, and so it was decided to cut through the whole problem by breeding a species of animal which actively wanted to be eaten and was capable of saying so. <laughs> and, and here I am. Um, I like a casserole of me, perhaps? A casserole of me, perhaps. <laughs> uh, uh, and and um, so they all say, yes, well, I'd like r rare steaks all round, um, except Arthur, who says, I have a green salad. <laughs> um, and the, and when, they've, when they've all up, made up their mind, the beast says, a very wise choice. I'll just go off to the kitchen and shoot myself. <laughs> Humanely. <laughs> uh, I... I, I love the idea that you not only can play with metaphors, but you can play with the playing of metaphors, and they've worked for you and against you, but they are, they're, 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 very, they're very much your friends. I, I, I just, in meeting some of these metaphors, I just, I just have to, before I get on to the, probably your favorite book uh, that you ever wrote, I, there was a time, you told me like earlier today you were in a television show, and so you, you have a green print on your tie, I guess, what are those? Like, yes. So, um, this is um, my, my my wife paints ties, so this is this is a hand painted tie, unique. It's it's um, leaf insects, and you can see, probably see that they're green. Today, uh, earlier today, I was interviewed on video, and uh, I noticed that behind the chair where I was to sit, there was a green screen, and, and you know what that means? Uh, that means that they are going to project all sorts of I sorts of images, but anything that's green will make a complete hole right through me. That's, that's how it works. Um, so I would have been there, and there would have been all kinds of things behind me in the background. And you would, the television viewers would be able to see right through me um, these holes. Like a fool, I warned them. I mean, it would have been wonderful if they'd taken it. The, the film would have gone viral. It would have been a... a <laughs> this tie of yours, or these ties of yours and your wife's have gotten you... I, can you tell the story, about, and then we'll leave this subject, but you met the Queen, and the Queen noticed your oh, tie. I, yes, uh, um, I, I, I was invited to lunch with the Queen. It was rather odd. Again. By yourself? Uh, no, no, there were a dozen of us, oh. and it was a very eclectic crowd. There was the Australian rugby captain. Um, <laughs> there was a leading ballerina. Uh, there was Britain's senior Muslim. Um, <laughs> and there were six corgis. Under the, under the table. Um, but anyway, I, for some reason, I was invited, and I was wearing one of my favorite ties, which Lala paint, painted, and it had warthogs on, on it. And warthogs are very nice animals, but they're, they're not very beautiful. And the queen looked at my tie and said, why do you wear such ugly animals on your tie? Really? Which I rather liked. I mean, I thought, she doesn't just talk in cliches. She actually says what she thinks, and I, I appreciated that. But anyway, I, re I replied, ma'am, if the animals are ugly, how much greater is the skill to make such a beautiful tie? Which, which I think shut her up, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
If St. Peter were to twist my arm and ask me, what did you do that should get you into heaven? The best I could do would be to point to the extended phenotype. So this is, the, this is where, so I, I, I don't know, I would have loved to have shown you a mud dauber, but I want you guys to imagine a wasp. So it looks kind of like a bee, but skinnier. And it's got um, stripes on it. And what it does is it goes, it goes to mud, wet mud, and it forms a, well, what it is, I think, is, is a place to have a baby in. Yeah, it's a, it's a nest. It's a, it's a mud tube. It builds a mud tube um, with partitions down the tube. And in each partition, it captures a spider, puts a, a dead, a rather paralyzed spider, not dead, paralyzed spider in there, and lays an egg on it, and then builds a partition and, bring, and brings a spider to the next chamber and so on. So it ends up with these, these pipes, wood, mud, mud pipes, with spiders, and each spider has an egg in it. So this is, a, this is an animal that makes things. This is an artifact. It's like a bird's nest um, or a beaver dam. Uh, it's common enough for animals to actually make things. Now, the observation here was, famously, he's written some books that say, look, genes are very important, and genes are, to some considerable extent, they're, they're, they're participants in your destiny. Um, but genes we usually think of as inside us and affecting us, the individuals or the vehicles, as he said. But then you take this step. You look at the mud dauber. Clearly, the nest is not the mud dauber. The mud dauber is making the nest. And what do you think? Well, the, the point about the nest, the point about this, this mud tube is that it's an organ. And it's, in principle, not different from the wasp's wings or its legs or, 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 or its stinger. Um, so it's part of the phenotype, but it's not part of the wasp's body. It's extended phenotype. And just as we always talk about the natural selection of genes that make things like wings and jaws and tails, you have to then talk about genes that make mud nests, because the mud nest is an adaptation in just the same way. Do you think that inside this wasp there's a gene saying, one sixteenth of an inch here. Don't, no, 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 yeah, no, one, yeah, no, kind no of. that's right. Yes, kind of. I mean, at, at least insofar as, the, as there are genes that also say the same thing about the length of the wings. So by some embryological process, the length of the wings is adjusted by genes to be not too long and not too short, just right. And exactly the same must be going on for these mud nests. But okay. you're suggesting that the genes inside us have fully expression, have full expression outside of our body. Via the behavior of the wasp, of course. I mean, it's done via the behavior of the, of the wasp. But the final phenotype on which the success of the genes is judged is the mud phenotype. So the, the shape of the nest, the, um, the thickness of the, of the mud, the color of the mud, perhaps even, um, Do all mud daubers make pretty much exactly the same nest? No, uh, um, that, 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 that would be as variable as anything as else genes, among I wasps. See. I mean, some of them don't have the same length of wings. Have scientists ever found or been able to say that the gene over here and the gene over here, if they've ever done the genome of a mud dauber, like this actually doesn't seem to affect the animal, it seems to affect the sculpture. That well, the it would have to affect the animal in the, insofar as it's the animal's behavior that does it. So uh, the, if, if you talk about the mud nest as the final phenotype, it's the end product of a chain, a cascade of, um, of, of causation, starting with the gene and working outwards. But that also is true of wings, of course. I mean, w wings are made by a process of embryonic development, which is itself under genetic control, is itself under the control of a, a sequence, a cascade of events. But it's a cascade that goes through the animal, out the, animal, the animal, into the world. Exactly. Right, let me do another one. I'm a nightingale. You're a girl nightingale, I'm a boy nightingale. You're over there, I'm over here. I like you, so I go up, la 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 I sing the nightingale romance song. My nightingale romance genes fully express. What's going on with you? Uh, uh, the the, be, the behavior Assuming that I, of the, I'm attractive to you. The, the behavior of the female nightingale uh, is, is part of the extended phenotype of the male nightingale. Um, we know not from nightingales, but we know from canaries and from ring doves that male courtship behavior, in, in the case of canaries' song, 
uh, actually causes the female's ovaries to grow. So, uh, and that affects the female's behavior, of course. So now, my song physically changes your ovaries? Yes. Um, that, and, I mean, that, that would be undisputed, but what might be, but my way of putting it would be that the female's, the change of the female is part of the extended phenotype. And in the case of Nightingale Song, because the Nightingale Song is so beautiful to our ears, it's very nice to think that the, um, uh, well, John Keats in the Ode to the Nightingale, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as those hemlock I had drunk. Um, Keats was drugged by the Nightingale Song. John Keats, the poet, was drugged by, by the Nightingale Song. Why wouldn't we then say the female Nightingale is drugged? Why wouldn't we regard the song as a manipulative drug used by the male to influence the female's behavior? And I think that's, that's a good way to look well, at it. Well, could you say that there's a gene in me, assuming I'm back being the romantic yeah. nightingale, there's a gene in me that is designed to create a change in you? Yes, via, via the, the, the song drug, yes. So you're a gene imperialist. Yes, sort you of. You are moving it out. Yes, yeah, sort of. Let's suppose that I designed the Chrysler Building. It is a deep and beautiful expression of my sense of penile power. <laughs> is the Chrysler building an extended phenotype prefer, of me? I'd prefer to say not in that case, and I'll tell you why. Um, the, in the case of, say, the mud dauber thing, there would be a very real sense in which genetic difference in wasps shows itself in uh, phenotypic difference in mud nests. But although the Chrysler building um, is, is in some sense a manifestation of the uh, architectural abilities of the architect, I very much doubt whether you could look at genetic differences in architects and, um, <laughs> it would show, and th that it would show itself in the difference between the Chrysler building and the Empire State building or something. Right, let me it, wouldn't, make it, it wouldn't work like that. You, 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 I'm almost sure you'd find that there are, there are genes that make for good architects and bad architects. There'd be genes that make for people who are good at visualizing three-dimensional shapes, and other, and, and other people would be genetically bad at visualizing three-dimensional shapes. But I'd very much doubt if there are genes for finials and Gothic architraves and, and, and uh, things <laughs> Well, like. let me, to make it more subtle, let's, instead of being a human architect, let's suppose I'm beaver number 187. So I'm in uh, Connecticut, and I'm chopping the wood, and I'm, 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 I'm taking that, that brook, and I'm, I'm creating a lake. I'm damming the brook to create a lake. Would you say that the lake that I make is a genetic expression of me? I'd say it was the extended phenotype of beaver genes, and, and, and I bet, it hasn't been done, of course, it, no, nobody's done this, but I would bet my shirt that, that there must have been genetic differences in beavers which showed themselves in different lake phenotypes. The phenotype is important, the lake is important to the survival of the beaver. You mean like you would be able to maybe look at a, at a, at a pond and say, that's Harry. That's, I saw I bet, several I other. Bet you, I bet you could. Um, and and but, uh, Otherwise, I mean, the, the reason I'm so confident in betting that is, that that is that the lake is clearly an adaptation. It's clearly doing the beaver some good. It must have been favored by natural selection. There must have been an evolutionary progression in which lakes got better and bigger over evolutionary time. That had to be selected, or that means that there were genes that had to, had to be selected. So there must have been genes for lakes. That's the, that's the extreme example of an extended phenotype. But you see what you're doing? You're making the gene, the gene is expressing itself in the body, out of the body, beyond the body. And at a certain point, you wonder, like, so what's the point of being me, the, as you put it, the taxi cab or vehicle in which the genes reside? You did say that herbivores and, and herbivores, herbivores and whatever's the other one called? Carnivores. Yeah, carnivores. Um, that they are going to need a different kind of cooperation in order to create yeah. the creature. Yeah. But what is, why do you need 
individuals at all in your secret no, well, world of... Excellent question. I mean, I, it, it, it is a fact that the, the enormous majority of the phenotypic effects of genes are confined to the body in which the gene sits. <laughs> so these things like beaver dams and, uh, and mud dauber tubes are a, a, an excrescence. They're, they're, an exc they're a, just a, a, a minority of phenotypic effects. But what I think is illuminating is that, is that you, by considering the extended phenotype, you're precisely led to ask the question you just asked, which is, what's the point of the individual at all? Why bother with the taxi cab? Why bother with the, with, with the, with the vehicle? And I think the answer to that really is that all the genes in an individual, they're, they're a kind of cooperative society of genes that are all working towards the same end, the reason they're working towards the same end is that they have the same expectation of the future, they have the same expectation of how to get into the next generation. Um, all, of our, all of our genes, since we're both male, um, are, have only one way of getting into the next generation, which is via <coughs> sperms. Uh, if we're female, it's via eggs. If we had genes that were breathed out of our noses, we would call them viruses. That's what viruses do. I mean, they, they, they have a different expectation, and so they are not cooperative. They're not interested in preserving the, the, the whole body in the way that most of our genes are. You are you saying that you, would, you think that the value of an individual, when you're speaking from the, from the perspective of the gene, comes down to the sex act, like is the reproductive act? Like, the rest of me, which carries my sperm and sort of houses it, is just getting ready for me to meet the girl, and I go Whew! and then the genes all get to move into the next one. So the genes are, and so... That is a sufficient explanation for our existence and for why we are the way we are, but it, it's not a sufficient explanation for why we as humans like the things that we do, like why we like music and poetry and, uh, and things like that. I mean, it, it, would be a, it would be a travesty if, if anybody were to run away with the idea that there's that, that although that's the biological purpose, is to, is to pass our genes on, that that's the only purpose we have. We humans make our own purposes, and they are only loosely based upon the fundamental biological purpose, which is gene reproduction. So if you could imagine a planet where genes just freely push themselves into the future but without bodies, um, that would be, while it is a sort of communist view of genes, like, like equal everywhere all at once, it would be a, a very depressing... Well, you could imagine a planet on which, on which life consisted of genes just floating around free in, in whatever equivalent of the sea is, um, and um, there wouldn't be DNA, but there'd have to be some other kind of... Um, and never, never getting together in these huge, great robots, which are in individual bodies. It, that's the way it ha happens to have happened on this planet. The genes got together and gradually built up over evolutionary time these gigantic, what I call lumbering robots, which all collaborate together in order to funnel themselves out of the present robot via the sperms or eggs into the next generation robot. That's the way it, it's happened. And the last chapter of The Selfish Gene raises that question, why, why are we built, why are we um, pushed into these huge great bodies rather than floating free? Uh, why is that book your favorite by far? Well, it's, I'm talking about the phenotype now. Yes, it, it's, it's, I suppose, m my, my most original huh. contribution. I mean, it's a bit mad, really, isn't it? But it, but it um, I, I think it's right. It's, 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 not, it, it, it's curious because it's not really a, a testable hypothesis. It's just a different way of looking at what's already familiar. And, uh, the other thing that I, that I read in one of your books was something what you called the genetic book of the dead. And what it says is, this is so fascinating, that I could give you a fossil of something. I wouldn't even have to tell you what it is. Oh, I could tell you it's a mollusk. Mm. And you could look at the mollusk and look at the fossil and you could decode it and you could figure out not just that it was a mollusk, but that it lived in a cold time or a hot time, in water or on land, in, with competitors or with not. You could read 
the, a world backwards. Yes, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't do it with a fossil. I think, I think you'd do it with a living animal, with, a, with an actual body. Um, I, I'm not saying I could do it. I'm saying yeah. that any animal body must contain within it the information which, if, if you were sufficiently expert, you could reconstruct the, not only its way of life, but the way of life of its ancestors. So, for example, you, 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 can, you know that a dolphin had, had land-dwelling ancestors. It was, its ancestors were land-dwelling mammals. Um, and you should be able to read that from its body and from its genes. And the genetic book of the dead, um, the genetic book of the dead, refers to the fact that the, the genes of the dolphin contain a coded representation of the, the worlds in which its ancestors lived. Uh, People can't do that at the moment, but I'm saying it's theoretically, it must be theoretically possible that there's a kind of history of the animal's ancestors written into the genes. You could tell from the, from the genes, this is, this is a, a marine animal, but 50 million years ago, uh, its ancestors lived on land. And 300 million years ago, its ancestors lived in the sea again. Uh, that, that, that information, I think, in principle, must be there. Uh, we, we haven't got the skill to read it at, at, at present, but that's what I mean by the genetic book of the dead. Well, the, to, to sort of wind up on this stuff, I, um, I have a notion that you're being sort of so-so or not so good at mathematics has been, I think, crucial to your career. You have some kid, now a man of some importance, who you met when he was a grad student and whom you went to for all your math problems, who was oh, studded throughout yes, this book. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, because I, I was reading Zia Haider Rahman's book, which is a, a called um, In the Light of What We Know. It's a, it's a novel. And he says, uh, he notices, this is one of the characters in the novel, he, he says, math, it's about how the purity of mathematics and how it doesn't need humans. And he writes, mathematics doesn't care about authority. It doesn't care who you are or where you're from or what your eye color is or who you're having supper with. In order to catch even a fleeting glimpse of the world, we have to break our regular, a familiar acceptance of the world. And we have to, he says, what, what a mathematics, mathematician does, they talk about the world in, in a science meeting as if they were a tad embarrassed, as if they didn't fully accept that anybody else could be interested in what they had to say, as if they were vaguely uncomfortable with this business of dissemination, a task auxiliary to their true calling, which is inquiry and discovery itself. A mathematician knows that nothing empirical, nothing which we are to perceive in this world can undermine so much as one whiff of doubt at any mathematical claim, because mathematical claims are pure, and the mathematician knows this, and he is free. My thought about you is that you're, because you're not talented as talented, and you're talented more with the words than with the math, you're not free. You are left to make, you have to make a case in each and every book. You have to explain what you've learned to people who are, don't know that much. You have, to be, you have to talk about feeling and contention, and you have to do storytelling, and you have to use charm, and you have to have confidence, and you need to have mood on. And the reason you're good at this is because you're not good at that. Yes, I think that's got a lot in that. Um, the the, the ex-student you're talking about, Alan Graffin, yeah. um, uh, who, who, who was my student, uh, I, I think my best student ever, um, and then he became my colleague and he became my mentor. Um, and he's now um, a, a, a professor at, at, at Oxford. Um, he has the quality of, I think, combining what you're talking about, because he is very good at mathematics. Um, but he has biological intuition as well. But biology is from time to time invaded by mathematicians who think they can come in, or physicists too, who think they can come in and clean up biology. And, and they fail. Al Alan's not like that. Um, he, uh, has superb biological intuition, the pricking of his thumbs. He knows what the right answer is by some kind of strange intuition. And I've sort of got that as well. But the difference is that Alan can then prove it mathematically afterwards. Um, whereas I, I have to say, I've got this intuitive feeling, Alan, go away and prove it for me. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, but don't you like falling short, not being able to prove it? 
and therefore you have to convince other people just using words, imagery, metaphor? John Maynard Smith, who is a great hero and a, a great biologist, quite a, and, and a mathematical biologist, wrote a review, a joint review, of both the selfish gene and the extended phenotype, in which he said, the thing that really baffles me about Dawkins is that there's not a single line of mathematics in any of his books, and yet he somehow gets the right answer. <laughs> um, and, and so he was, he was baffled because he thinks you, he, he, from, in, in his world, you do need mathematics um, to, get, to get the... He said, he said of me, I rather like this phrase, he appears to think in prose. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, there was a, there's, some, there's a place where there, there are people who, for over the centuries, I sh I'll get onto the questions in just a sec, but there, I think you at one point quoted Hobbes, I think, um, who, well, I shouldn't bother, I should just do questions. Questions now, questions. Uh, this is from, given your renowned ability to communicate in writing, how do you think you're doing with Twitter? Do we have to go there? <laughs> it's been such a good evening so far. <laughs> um, Twitter is a horrible medium for communicating anything serious. It's, it's quite good for um, aphoristic communication. Um, it's quite good for throwing a thought out which might be elaborated. Um, so, um, what one example, for instance, is, is if I'm wandering a, through a wood and I see lots and lots of leaves, green leaves, and I think these leaves are solar panels. They're, they're soaking up photons that are coming down from the, from the sun. That's, the whole of life depends upon these solar panels. The reason they're so uh, thin, the reason they have a big surface area compared to their volume is that they are, they are solar panels. I wonder what the total area in square miles of leaf in the world is. Um, now that's a perfect question to throw out to Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not a question that I can answer, but it's something that gets people thinking and talking. So I think Twitter's very good for that kind of thing. It's very good for saying, um, come and hear me interviewed by Robert Krulwich in the 92nd Street Y. It's good for that kind of thing. Um, but it's not very good for getting into arguments. Here's, here's a question about, this is actually interesting. Um, what good are words in describing nature? Do they help or do they hurt? So let me, let me ask it, it's interesting. Let me ask you, like, if I say that's an elm tree, well then, I've just told you that it's a kind of tree that you could look up in a book. It has a certain shape, a certain kind of fruit, da 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 da. But if I said, look at that green, beautiful green thing over there, those are two ways of referring to it. One, I suppose, brings you to facts, and the other brings you to feeling. Do you think that words help us? or do they distance us from the things we see around us? I don't know of any other way to describe things than by words. Um, the, the, the poetry, I mean, the, uh, the, the poetry that, that you, you can use words to, to, to evoke a feeling about a tree, uh, and I, I greatly appreciate that as well. I, I appreciate the emotive force of words. I'm haunted by uh, poetic phrases, by poetic words, by poetic images. Um, so I, I, I think we should use words in both ways. Or maybe if, if you said, that's a meadow, or you said, look, there's cottontail, and da 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 da, you use more words, you, you describe the things in the meadow. Do you think, I don't know, uh, do you think that detail helps? or the detail takes you away? Depends what you're trying to do. I, yeah, I mean, I in, in, in some cases, yes, it certainly helps. What is your most scientifically unsubstantiated personal belief? <laughs> oh, that's nice. Um, uh, it is that um, if there is life elsewhere in the universe, 
We don't know that there is, but I bet there is. But if there's life in the universe, it will be Darwinian life. It will have come about by something equivalent to Darwinian natural selection. That's something I can't prove. That's something I have no direct evidence for. It's something that I simply bet my shirt on. Uh, and I, and um, really because, well, the, 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 the weak form of the argument is that nobody's ever suggested any alternative um, that, that, that works. Even Lamarckism, which is theoretically an alternative, um, I believe the objection to Lamarckism, that's the inheritance of acquired characteristics. The, the blacksmith's arms get, get big and strong because he's always exercising them, and so the blacksmith's son inherits his enlarged muscles by inheritance of acquired characteristics. So it's the principle of use and disuse followed by the principle of inheritance of acquired characteristics. Use and disuse, it really is true that if you use muscles, they get bigger, and it happens not to be true on this planet that acquired characteristics like enlarged muscles are inherited. Many people have said, many biologists have said, if only there was a planet where acquired characteristics were inherited, evolution could be non-Darwinian, it could be Lamarckian. I have denied that um, because I think if you actually look at the principle of use and disuse, even if acquired characteristics were inherited, use and disuse is not a big enough principle to do the job of producing adaptation. Um, it works for the blacksmith's arms. It doesn't work for much else. It doesn't work for things like the eye. The eye doesn't become a better eye the more you use it. Why should it? The lens doesn't become more transparent as photons wash through it. Um, if anything, uh, the more you use a bit of your body, the the less good it becomes. It wears out. It becomes pitted and scarred. Hmm. And, and, um... uh, Professor Dawkins, great fan of your work, says Edward. Can you tell us how your friend Christopher Hitchens influenced your career and focus and life? I wasn't one of his early circle of friends, like Martin Amis and Ian McEwan. I only met him, I think, after we'd both written our God books, The God Delusion and God is Not Great. So I only knew him for sort of the last um, ooh, five or so, six, six years of his, of his life. Um, he influenced me in that, I mean, I n enormously admired his oratory, uh, his quickness on his feet, his erudition, his knowledge, um, his uh, experience, his repartee, his wit. Um, he. But that's not, in itself, I suppose, influence. That's admiration. Um, he, I, I, I interviewed him. I think I may have been the last person to give him a formal interview before he died uh, for New Statesman magazine, which I was guest editor for at, at, at that time for just one issue. Um, and he told me uh, very straight out, I said that I was a little bit worried that people think I'm strident. People call me strident and shrill. Um, and I said, I, I don't think I'm strident, but a lot of people do. And he, and he said, don't you ever stop being strident. Don't you ever um, be frightened of people calling you strident. That's exactly what you should be. And uh, that made an, an impression on me. I'm not strident, but I, I take comfort. <laughs> I was actually in this theater Sitting over there, I think, Tony Lewis was sitting where you were sitting, Hitchens was sitting where I'm sitting, and he got people so mad that there were people in the front who were hitting each other with, I don't think they were playbills, but they were whatever it was that we, everybody was given. Like, bang, bang. Seriously. And these were old Jewish people going, yeah, give me that, thank you. And I thought, wow, this Christopher Hitchens knows how to put on a show. And Tony Lewis didn't know what to do. It was like one of my favorite nights at the Y, weirdly. I, I, uh, uh, I'm supposed to stop in any second, but... Um, uh, let me just ask you about Doug, Douglas Adams. That's, that's the friend that I'm sort of curious about. Like, how did you meet him? This is the, the, no, Doug Adams. This is the this oh, oh, right. um, Hitchhiker's Guide guy. Yeah, yes. Um, well, I, I wrote him a fan letter. It's the only fan letter I've ever written. Um, really? Uh, it, was, it was for Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. And um, he, it, he, he wrote back and said he was a fan of mine as well. So, so he invited me to go to London to his house, which I did, and... Um, oh, uh, like, like a fanboy? Did you, like, did yes, you not know what to... Yeah, like, you yes. kind of rang the bell? Um, and... 
That's right, and, and, and he opened the door, and he was laughing even as he opened the door, and I think he was laughing at his anticipation of my reaction to his enormous height. I mean, he was, must have been nearly seven feet tall, um, and he must have been used to people being amused at this, so, so, so um, he, he, he laughed. But then... So um, the door opens, and there's a laughing giant That's in the right, door. yes, yeah. And, so um, did that, that, was that good for he, you? Like, did wonderful, you, yeah, uh, yes, and he... Um, he introduced me to my wife a little bit later, I think it was two years, two years later. Now, in that scene in your book, you and your wife are these teeny people. That's right, yes. And then there's um, Doug talking to some other a, tall person. That's right. It was, it was a party that he gave, I think, for his 40th birthday. And he invited me because I was a fan of his, and he, and he invited Lala because he had been the script editor of Doctor Who when she was the um, Doctor Who's girl, whatever she's called, Doctor Who's companion. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that was where he, and he took me over and introduced me to her. She was talking to Stephen Fry. And Stephen Fry is kind of as tall as Douglas Adams. They're both about seven feet tall. So um, Lala and I were sort of talking to each other down there. <laughs> and Stephen Fry and Douglas Adams were talking to each other up there. They formed a kind of gothic arch over <laughs> um, exchanging lofty witticisms <laughs> high above us. Uh, and so we were sort of forced to meet down here, and I shyly asked, uh, we, I said, agreed with Lala that um, it was much too noisy, this party, and wouldn't it be a good idea if we just slipped out, had a bit of dinner somewhere? Um, Did the tall ones notice? And of we... course, no, no, and, and, and of course, um, you know, we, we'd said, well, well of course, we, we'd, we'd come back. So we went off and had some dinner at an Afghan restaurant, and... Uh, we never went back to the party. Uh, that party was like a weird party. Doug Adams decided not to give you, tell you you were sitting at chair number two at table seven. He simply... That, that was his 42nd birthday. You oh. know, 42 is a very significant number oh, yes. in, in, in yes. his, his world. So he had this huge dinner party for his 42nd birthday. And he had a, a table plan. It was about 100 people, actually. And the table plan didn't say you're sitting here and you're sitting here and you're sitting there. It said the person on your left is, as it were, Robert Crowlwich. The person on your right is what, whoever, whoever it was. Um, so the, my neighbor it had a card that said the person on your uh, right is Richard Dawkins. Ask him to say grace. Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, if, everybody, if everybody is told who's to their left and who to their right, but they don't know imagine. where to go, how do you sort it's a, yourself? It's an immensely complicated <laughs> problem. And, and um, we didn't sit down to dinner until about midnight. <laughs> he was so busy with his fleet of Macintosh computers trying to get the, this thing sorted out. Uh, uh, well, um, so, so here's the deal for you folks. If you want to buy this book, which contains many of the things we have talked about, it also has, in the last half... Frankly, if you, I shouldn't say this, you should buy all 13 of his books, but if you want to sort of take a sort of a quick flight through all of them, this, what this is, this is like kind of amazing. So this, this book, which it, it tells you about like what it's like to have academic, academic life and have puddings with very unfortunately politically incorrect names, that's at the front. In the back, it's pretty much his life work sort of gorgeously compressed. So, Many of the ideas, but not as many of the wonderful, glorious examples that drive you to distraction at, in envy, but many of, the, many of the thoughts are just perfectly set down in the last half of this book. So if you want to buy it, he'll sign it. He'll do that in a room over there, starting very shortly. So you can just line up, and he will do that for you. And hey, thank you really very, very much for hanging thank out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.